This Week on Waterways. Florida Panthers, a conservation success story. And pharmaceuticals in our waters. A few days each month, Mark Perry sits at his computer in Everglades National Park's Daniel Beard Center, analyzing photographs. Wild turkeys, feral pigs, black bears, gray fox. All interesting images, but these photos are only bycatch, meaning these animals are not the species he's targeting with his lens. Mark is looking for photos of the endangered Florida panther. Puma, catamount, mountain lion, panther. There are many names for these large cats. Years ago, there were thought to be 24 subspecies of mountain lion. Today, using modern genetic testing, biologists now know that there are far fewer subspecies, somewhere between four and six, with the Florida panther being one of them. This subspecies existed throughout the East Coast. It was in Louisiana, it was in Georgia, it was everywhere. They're very widespread. This is the last place they are. Historically, the Florida panther inhabited the entire southeastern United States. However, following European colonization of North America, most of the panther population was eliminated due to multiple factors. There was widespread habitat destruction as forests were cleared for farmland. Their prey base was decimated to feed a young country's growing population, and the panthers themselves were excessively hunted because they were viewed as a danger to humans and livestock. The East Coast was the first to be colonized, and you know, you've got this big, fierce predator, and so the predator is eliminated, and so it's consistently eliminated. And before long, you know, uh, there are no panthers anymore, and so, the only place that panthers could possibly be would be in Florida in the remotest areas. Because of the vast stretches of uninhabitable landscape in what are now Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve, the last remaining panther populations were able to find refuge and survive. It's here, in Everglades National Park, that field biologist Mark Perry has strategically placed 38 cameras in 29 locations spread over 200 square miles. These cameras will help resource managers monitor the regional population of Florida panthers. Every six weeks, Mark crawls through thickets overgrown with poison ivy, poison wood, and invasive Brazilian pepper, all to ensure his cameras are working properly. Cameras have gotten a whole lot better. You used to have to visit them almost weekly um, just because they burned up batteries so quickly. My biggest problem out here really is, especially once it starts raining, the vegetation growing in front of the cameras. All of this energy and commitment from the staff at Everglades National Park and Big Cypress National Preserve is for one goal, the survival of the endangered Florida panther. In the 1980s, South Florida's panther population was down to only 20 to 30 individuals. Today, they are on the rebound with an estimated population of around 120. To many, this is an endangered species success story. In 1973, the Florida panther was placed on the endangered species list. Although it was not known exactly how many panthers were left, it was known that the numbers were low enough to be a major concern to scientists. The gene pool was shrinking for these animals, and the effects were obvious. What was found in the um, early years of panther research is that the panthers were in poor condition. Um, the 
their blood levels, their uh, muscling just wasn't good. They, they just didn't seem to be in good condition. The big clincher that made the agencies realize that something really needed to be done was when several male panthers were caught that had no descended testicles. So it was realized that these animals were spiraling into extinction and something needed to be done. In order to save the Florida panther, an interagency decision was made by key agencies. Among them, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and the National Park Service to recruit genes from a separate gene pool from the cat's closest relatives, mountain lions from West Texas. In 1995, eight female, adult female panthers from Texas were brought to South Florida and reintroduced in different locations. The idea, the concept was that these females would reproduce with a male Florida panther and um, they would bring some new genetic material into this population. Resource managers placed two West Texas female cats in Everglades National Park, four in Big Cypress National Preserve, and two in Fakahatchee Strand Preserve State Park. And the next thing you know, over a relatively very short period of time, in now that's what, not quite 20 years ago? In that period of time, we've gone from maybe 20, 30 individuals to last count of known, that we knew absolute estimates of, of 120 in just 20 years. Now you're talking about an animal that breeds about every two years. It's remarkable. I mean, the animals are spreading out, they're moving in inhabiting areas that they hadn't been in for a long time, and that some people thought, well, that's not panther habitat. Well, as it turns out, lo and behold, it is panther habitat. They're primarily active near dawn and dusk and after dark. Um, in the wintertime, you'll get more daytime images because they're, uh, they're out and they're more active. They're, cats are fairly heat sensitive. I'd say typically, if you were gonna average it across the year, probably 90% or better of our uh, images of panthers are, are at dark or dawn and dusk. Mark places cameras in locations that funnel the panthers directly in front of the lens. The more pictures Mark has of a panther, the easier it is to identify the individual. Trying to distinguish between panthers is difficult. A kink in the tail, colics on the back, dominant scars, tears in the ears. Even people who have been working on panthers for many, many years have trouble telling them apart from one another. One of the things I've been doing is using photo editing software to get in on those specs, calculate the ratios between them, because they change. You can't just necessarily look at it and say, oh, there's the same pattern. But that ratio doesn't really change between them. So you find a few that are pretty obvious, and you can pull those out of different photos, run that on them again. It's essentially like looking at a, a constellation, and you can tell you're looking at the same animal. So while he still might be uncertain about which panther he is looking at in a photo, Mark is much more certain about threats to their survival. The threats come mostly from humans. While there is occasional cat-on-cat -cat mortality, most panther deaths result from collisions with cars and trucks. But the largest threat to the survival of this species is loss of habitat. That's the biggest threat, not having the habitat. And the habitat continues to be destroyed for various reasons, for development, for roadways. A lot of people working hard to not have that happen, but not only do we need to stop, stop losing habitat, but we need to restore some of it and make it available to cats again. Each male panther needs up to 125 square miles of habitat that overlaps with a female's range of roughly 25 square miles. These numbers can change depending on the quality of their available habitat. 
Resource managers believe the panther population in Big Cypress National Preserve to be saturated and in need of more space. This need is dispersing panthers into more populated communities west of Big Cypress, such as the city of Naples. In 2012 alone, 20 pet and livestock deaths were attributed to panthers. Ever since the first recovery plan was written in the 1970s, one of the top goals was to establish two additional permanent populations in the panther's historic range. According to a 2003 study by the University of Tennessee, two of the best potential locations for panther reintroduction were in Arkansas, another in Georgia. We've already documented uh, a male in North Florida and in Georgia. Um, they, they ended up being dead and then the genetics work was done on them and it was shown that they did come from South Florida. So we believe that there is potential for North, the North Florida-Georgia interface to support a population of panthers if the public supports it. What it's going to come down to ultimately is uh, how willing people are to, to make some concessions to, to live not only in proximity with these cats but to, to give them areas where they can survive, where they can continue to to reproduce and to live and give them corridors where they can move from one population to the next so we don't have the, the, bottle, the genetic bottlenecking that almost wiped them out. As with any endangered species success story, there needs to be public support for continued success. Is there public support in northern Florida or Georgia or Arkansas to relocate some of South Florida's panthers to try and jumpstart new populations? These new population pockets could help enhance genetic diversity, strengthening the panther population as a whole. But without a strong education campaign behind it, any panther reintroductions could meet the same opposition that wolf reintroductions were up against in the Western United States. But the reason that the agencies haven't taken panthers from South Florida where the population is saturated and relocated them into other areas is because of not having the public support to do so. And that's understandable because this is a predator, because it's been documented that the cougars, the mountain lions out west have indeed killed people, that they eat uh, white-tailed deer, and it's white-tailed deer are a, a, a favorite uh, hunting, recreational hunting uh, animal for some. It's just the, the, the chronic difficulty that uh, we have in reintroducing a potentially threatening predator um, into where people live. Just as communities in South Florida have learned to live with these top predators, communities farther north could learn to coexist with the Florida panther as well. It may well be essential for their continued success. I believe it has been a success story. Uh, I believe we started the work just in time to, to save the panther. We, I think we already have a success story but I think we could have a second success story by uh, getting panthers in other parts of their historic range. Each year in July, hundreds of divers and snorkelers visit the coral reefs of Lou Key for a very unique event the Underwater Music Festival. Subsurface speakers fill the shallow reef with music and messages about coral reef conservation, while costume divers mug for underwater cameras. Divers here practice the old aquatic adage, take only photos and leave only bubbles. Yet scientists theorized that they were actually leaving something else here five miles offshore something worth further study. We figured out that that's probably one of the largest concentrations of uh, people in the water at a given time that we can predict. You can go to other reefs and you know maybe you have a lot of divers in one week and maybe you don't but you know with the underwater festival uh, 
at the underwater music festival, we knew that we were going to have a set of uh, people in the water for a short period of time. Dr. Piero Giardinelli is a professor of chemistry at Florida International University and researcher for the Southeast Environmental Research Center. His specialty is finding trace compounds, or microscopic combinations of elements and chemicals, in freshwater and coastal environments. With the Underwater Music Festival, Piero found a unique research opportunity. So uh, we looked into it and said, well, we, why don't we just go and sample uh, before, during, and after the, the festival and see what we get. And um, eventually we published a paper about it and we did find, uh, we did find caffeine uh, in the water. Uh, we did find traces of the hormones uh, in the water. Dr. Giardinelli tested for caffeine, not because he's worried about caffeine's effect on the environment, but rather the presence of caffeine would be an indicator that there may be other elements in the water from a human source. Compounds that are created to have biological effects, pharmaceuticals such as antibiotics and hormones. Scientists have long been aware of the connection between good water quality and the health of coral reef and seagrass ecosystems. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary's Water Quality Protection Program, with the direct management of the Environmental Protection Agency and the state of Florida's Department of Environmental Protection, has been studying the coral reefs, seagrass, and water quality of the Florida Keys since 1994. One such monitoring program studies a variety of water quality parameters, including temperature, salinity, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, and excess nutrients all known factors affecting water quality and the health of the marine environment. But a piece of the Florida Keys water quality puzzle not yet thoroughly studied is the presence of man-made compounds and pharmaceuticals, and their potential effects on the plants and animals that call those waters home. And all the pharmaceuticals that we use, our bodies don't use them all up. All, all of our birth control pills, all of, all of our different uh, medications that we use for the many different ailments uh, that, that we have, they pass through our bodies, they, they go into our sewerage systems. So I said, well, you know, I wonder if it could be that connection between uh, what we put in the sink that goes into the septic and gets into the environment. So I looked for caffeine. And uh, so we pick up a couple of places, you know, the Miami River was one. And uh, uh, one of my students and myself, we went and collect samples and uh, it was there, you know, in front of us, you know, we detected caffeine uh, in, in the Miami River. During the years 1999 and 2000, the U.S. Geological Survey conducted a study of 139 streams across the country and detected pharmaceutical compounds in 80% of the streams sampled. There's one type of pharmaceutical that has scientists especially nervous about finding in our waters, called endocrine disruptors. The endocrine system in an animal, including humans, is the system of glands that secrete and control hormones. For example, the pituitary gland produces a hormone that regulates growth. The adrenal glands produce a hormone that regulates the fight or flight reflex. Ovaries produce a hormone that regulates reproduction. As the name implies, endocrine disruptors stop or change the biological effect of a hormone on a living organism. For example, human birth control pills change a woman's fertility. However, when these disruptors get into the marine environment, they now have the potential to interrupt or change the reproductive system in fishes and invertebrates. There's been work done in freshwater lakes that show that uh Things that get into the water in low concentrations uh, can cause masculinization of fishes. That is, uh, fish that would normally be female start developing male, uh, male uh, organs. Uh, alligators have the same, uh, same problem in Lake Apopka. It's been found that uh, most of the alligators there have been masculinized, turned into males. Um, so that these, these things that get into the water either through uh, people putting them down the sink or toilet. But why have we not heard about this issue before now? Surely these contaminants have been in the environment for years. 
the uh, ability to test for these things in lower concentrations has uh, developed and uh, we're now seeing these things in water which we never saw before because we didn't have the abilities to test for the, those low concentrations. Possible endocrine disruptors may find their way into our environment not just through pharmaceuticals, but through personal care products, like antibacterial chemicals found in hand sanitizers, flame retardant chemicals found in most clothing and building materials, or even chemicals in insect repellents, sunscreens, fragrances, and plastics. So it's not only a, a, a sewage issue where they think things can go through the treatment plant, but also a, um, a solid waste issue where uh, plastics uh, can have this effect on uh, non-target organisms. Plasticizers are added to plastics to increase flexibility, and many have endocrine disruptor features, or chemicals which can mimic compounds such as estrogen and cause problems with endocrine systems of the animals that ingest them. You get a piece of plastic and you pick it up on the side of the, uh, on the beach and it's brittle and it snaps. And that used to be a part of a very flexible plastic bottle. And the reason that it's not flexible anymore is that all the plasticizers that were in that piece of plastic have gone out of that, out of that plastic and they've gone into the, into the waters. A fish is developing and it's undergoing its own uh, 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 growth and all of a sudden it starts taking in a endocrine disruptor from a plastic bottle that's breaking down in the water. That can change the whole reproductive characteristics of that fish, fish species. In the Florida Keys, one of the victories for the marine conservation effort in the past decade has been the construction of wastewater treatment plants and conversion from old septic systems and cesspits to central processing facilities. In addition to the removal of solids, wastewater treatment has traditionally been designed to remove agents that are regulated, such as pathogens, viruses, and bacteria. Though there are very few treatment plants that actually remove dissolved pharmaceuticals before releasing treated effluent back into the environment, it can be done. Most of these compounds get degraded when exposed to UV light or strong oxidants like ozone. Carbon filtration is also effective at removing certain contaminants from wastewater. How widespread is the availability of all these new fancy techniques? And uh, I will say it's, it's, it's an economic question more than, than anything else. If your source of drinking water, you know, the water that you take into your plant, uh, is relatively clean, uh, and the wastewater that you put on your wastewater treatment plant is not affecting your drinking water, then usually the system doesn't have those advanced treatments. Upgrading the capabilities of a local or regional wastewater treatment plant to remove pharmaceuticals may one day be implemented. That is, if the cost-benefit is deemed worthy of the expenditure. However, there is something everybody can do to help make sure the amount of these compounds in our waters remain at harmless levels. It is essential for the health of our waters that people properly dispose of unused or expired medicine. Do not flush medicine down the toilet or throw it in the trash. To properly dispose of your pharmaceutical waste, please contact your local waste management service. In the Florida Keys, you may drop off your unused medicine at Monroe County Sheriff substations. Many pharmacies will also accept expired or unwanted prescriptions. I am worried, though, that we are putting chemicals uh, out in the environment that we don't fully know what the consequences are. And uh, again, I don't want to alarm anybody. All I'm saying is that we just have to understand uh, what they do, okay? And it would be a good idea for every chemical that it's, it's produced uh, that uh, not only you do your typical, you know, human risk and, you know, animal risk and so on, but uh, at some point in time, you do some kind of environmental risk. When it comes to good water quality, there's more than meets the eye. Thankfully, 
The long-term monitoring efforts of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary's Water Quality Protection Program enable resource managers to detect changes in the marine environment and, in turn, create management policies to address them. Yet, as new threats emerge, additional science is needed to understand these dangers and their effects on the environment.